Hi there, here's a revision video looking at 10 flaws of GDP per capita as a measure of living standards. Well, here's a chart, first of all, showing the countries with the highest per capita GDP in dollars in 2015. You can see that countries such as Luxembourg and Switzerland and Qatar and Norway are streets ahead of many other countries, well ahead of the United States, for example, and uh, the likes of Singapore and Australia. UK comes in around $43,000 on a per capita basis expressed in dollar terms. But uh, the purpose of this video is to think a little bit for a reason about why GDP data can give a distorted picture, if you like, of, of living standards in a particular country. Our focus is probably going to be on developed countries in this session. Here are some flaws. The starting point, of course, is that what we're trying to measure is somewhat artificial. We're trying to capture in GDP terms the value of output of goods and services expressed at constant prices divided by the population. So a kind of measure of output per person. So what are, what are, the, what are the difficulties, what are the reasons for the distortion of GDP as a measure of our living standards? First, of course, is that GDP per capita, which is an average, uh, is going to hide some big variations, some big inequalities in income and wealth. Average incomes might be rising, but actually inequality could, could grow at the same time. And check out our uh, YouTube videos on the Gini coefficient and the Palmer ratio as a measure of income inequality. Uh, secondly, uh, leisure and working hours. So an increase in GDP might have been achieved at the expense of leisure time, for example, if workers are required to work longer hours, or perhaps working conditions have deteriorated. There are plenty of industries in the UK offering fairly poor wages and, and difficult uh, conditions. Um, GDP might have gone up, but there could be a consequence, a trade-off for family life, for work-life balance, for example. I think point three is quite important. GDP literally measures gross domestic product, and gross makes no allowance for the depreciation of capital. So it could be the case that a country goes on a bit of a growth spurt and is using their capital goods more intensively. Motorways, telecommunication systems, factories, tools, all that kind of stuff. Now, if if that is the case, in the short term, gross domestic product will be higher. But of course, it could well lead to a significant depreciation of capital. Uh, so some economists argue that instead of GDP per capita, we should be looking at net uh, national output per capita as a, as a slightly different measure. The value of changes in years of people's healthy life expectancy is important. Um, you know, improvements in life expectancy don't always show through in the GDP accounts and crucially for many people's well-being it's, it's not just how long they live it's, it's how many years of healthy life they can expect for example beyond retirement age and how do you, how do you value that? It's a, it's a very tricky thing to do Point five is a common point made in exams the value of non-marketed output so you know, a lot of useful, socially useful and economically valuable work is, is not actually sold in markets. It doesn't have a market price. So the value of the output of people working for charities who are contributing to self-help groups, the value of work done in the home, looking after children or an elderly infirmed relative, for example. This is important social output. It has a social welfare dimension. It's not picked up necessarily by the GDP accounts. To that extent, GDP underestimates the, t the true amount of economic activity. Point six is important, the innovation and the quality of the products that we consume. Uh, so new goods and services become available because of invention and, 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 and innovation. Uh, indeed, you know, there are products which we now take for granted, the smartphone, for example, or whatever it is, you know, the, the flat screen TV, which wouldn't have been available to the richest person on the planet you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so from hip replacements to insulin to antibiotics to computers to what have you, safety bags in cars, you know, how do we measure, how do we try to capture the value of innovation in products? Seven is an important one, sustainability. So, for example, a big rise in economic growth could actually cause a, a degradation of our natural capital and the, the potential to have long-term economic consequences. Defensive spending is point eight. This is the idea that much spending is basically uh, to protect against an economic or a social bad. You know, for example, crime or 
spending to clean up the effects of pollution. Well, that adds to GDP, but you wouldn't necessarily say that these negative externalities are improvement in, in social welfare. And the notable point is that gross domestic product doesn't really take into account the amount of debt or the cost of servicing that debt. So you have, for example, quite a few countries that are fairly rich in GDP per capita terms, but have a huge amount of debt. And going forward, future generations of taxpayers and consumers will have much higher debts to pay, which could constrain both their spending power and also the ability of their national governments to spend on important public and merit goods and welfare. And then point 10 is really about the digital economy. So many things these days on the web you, you kind of basically consume for free. How do, you, how do you measure the utility and the value of the services that we consume digitally for free? I love this quote. Uh, from The Economist just a few weeks back. These days it seems that a growing fraction of innovation is not measured at all. In a world where houses are Airbnb hotels and private cars are taxes, where free software upgrade renews all computers, and uh, you're watching this on YouTube, and I hope, hope you're not paying, um, you know, many suspect GDP is becoming an ever more misleading measure. Uh, so this is a really important issue, and it's a great point to make in exams. The digital economy clearly creates a lot of output and creates jobs and profits and revenues, but it doesn't. The GDP accounts don't necessarily pick up a lot of the service utility and satisfaction and connectivity uh, that we generate on the web, which doesn't really have a market price. So GDP per capita as a concept is important. It's a useful benchmark. I think it's important also to be aware of some of the flaws of GDP per capita for trying to measure living standards. Thank you.